talk about a related to topic. I thought we'd talk about a related topic. But thank you. Um I'm going to be a little circuitous in how we get there. So just bear with me for about 10 or 15 minutes. I wanted to go over a, a section of verses. I'm good. I'm fine. It's okay. I can, I can see it. Um, I want to go over a section of verses at the beginning of the 12th chapter of the Gita and then work forward from there. So, Krishna and Arjuna are having a conversation, and there's this, what's called a theophany. A theophany is a moment where God reveals himself in this world in a miraculous vision. There's a, a technical term for that, a theological term for that. It's called a theophany. So there is such a theophany. Other examples of theophanies in world literature would be burning bushes, in the Hebrew Torah, the voice from heaven when Jesus got initiated by John the Baptist, etc., etc. There's, you know, if you look at world religious literature, you know, uh, voices from the mountain, from Allah speaking to Muhammad and dictating the Quran, the idea of the golden tablets in the Mormon tradition. I mean, if you look around, there's generally speaking a theophany, a manifestation of divinity in this world. That's the genesis of most religions. In fact, a religion is really a purported history, a claimed history. Somebody alleges that this happened at this point in time, thousands of years ago. God spoke to a person. That person becomes the prophet. And then what that person gave becomes religious. Whether it's the tablets and the Ten Commandments, the Ark of the Covenant, or the burning bush or different instructions which were given subsequently to Moses, uh, God's interactions with Abraham, Allah, Jesus either as an intermediary between God and man or as God with the apostles being the intermediary. What you have when you have the birth of a religion is somebody says, hey, God appeared to me, God spoke to me, this happened. Could be Joseph Smith, could be a brand new cult Last week, somebody says, makes a claim that God spoke to me. And then for the faithful, that claim is true. And therefore, there's weight and there's evidence. And the teachings themselves stand as revelatory evidence of the legitimacy of the tradition. Do you guys follow that? I'm trying to give you a basic background in world religion and a certain theme that's going to be there in every religion on the planet. If you guys were paying attention, you should have followed it because I did speak coherently. But it's, if you spaced out there, that would be a problem. Didn't space out there. That was, this is a pretty, like, it's, I'm shortening. You normally have to take a world religion class. Probably a couple of them. And then your professor's not being well versed in what they're teaching, they probably still wouldn't get this across to you. I'm trying to hack it for you, make it real quick. Think about it, logically. If you were to say, God never interacted with the world, you just cut the legs out of your own tradition. <laughs> Therefore, the bona fides, the legitimacy of any tradition, depends on saying this miracle occurred this interaction between divinity and mankind occurred. It had to happen at least one time. Because if it didn't happen one time, then what becomes invalidated? Yeah? The very tradition you are trying to espouse. There you go. You guys got it. So theophanies abound. There has to be at least one of them for every tradition. Otherwise, their tradition doesn't get off the ground. What are they going to say? We're speculating, 
hopelessly, we have no connection to divinity, it's all just coming from our fertile imagination, how would that be attractive? How would that be seductive? How would that convince anybody? So, because all religions have this in common, then if you look at an exotic tradition, such as the Gita, exotic compared to the normal boilerplate stuff that's standard in the U.S., for example. Um, of course, the Gita would be normative, and Christianity would be exotic and unusual. Imagine for a moment that you weren't raised in the U.S., and not all of you were raised in the U.S. Imagine for your good. Yeah, you just keep working. You're good. Um, imagine for a moment that you weren't raised in the U.S. and you didn't grow up drinking in Christianity with your mother's breast milk. And imagine if you were just a Martian and you showed up on Earth and you wanted to understand about the nature of religious practice in this world and somebody said, okay, Christianity is the religion of about half the world's population, a little less than half, three-sevenths of the world's population, three billion Christians. And if you want to include the Muslims as a subsequent faith, although it's not really so connected, but um, if you want to include that, now you're looking at five-sevenths to over two-thirds of the world's population. Um, and and it's, so he said, okay, you know, you're a Martian. He so said, what, what do you guys believe? What's the, what's the cornerstone of your faith? What's the, what are the cardinal principles? What's your credo is the technical term. Uh, you know, a tight philosophical catechism of your teachings so that anybody can understand the most important things of your tradition so they won't mistake minor virtues for major virtues. Usually a serious tradition will put together a catechism or a creed and that creed lays out the most important things to that group of people. And in fact, there is a creed for Christianity. It's called the Nicene Creed. It was made in the early 4th century. And if you read it, it is unbelievably tight. And it really represents 99.5% of the Christianity in this world, which is insane. To have that level of fidelity to a core set of teachings over a 2,000 year period, going the world over to every major country in the world, in every language of the world, and to maintain that degree of coherence, to, to maintain the monolithic nature of the tradition, it never, it never happens like that. Things fracture. Um, anyway, Christianity did a marvelous job of maintaining its core teachings, and in fact, it, 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 it was smart. It, it, they made a creed. And if you look, Catholics, Orthodox, Protestant, the major three denominations, and you look even at the minor denominations within the Protestant movement, they all follow the same basic stuff. And you could imagine, if you said to somebody, You could imagine if you said to them, well, so what are the cornerstones of your faith? And you said, and here you go, but you got you to pretend you didn't grow up with Christianity, if you did. If you're from India, this will be easy for you. Get that door closed. Um, here we go. God had a son. That's somewhat vexing. God had a son, and he sacrificed his son in a blood sacrifice. In other words, a human sacrifice is the cornerstone of our faith. Like the like the Mayans, like that. So God did a blood sacrifice and his son was the sacrificial lamb. 
And as he bled, his blood washed away the sins of the world. So, you know, justice is like an old world form of justice where you had slaves and then you could have those slaves suffer on your behalf. So if you were, if you committed a crime and you were punished in an old world situation, you could nominate your son or your slave and then they would be punished on your behalf, beheaded or... We've out, we outlawed that all over the world. Every modern system of justice outlaws that. You can't have somebody else take your punishment for you. But in our worldview, God was doing that. And slavery was okay too. A bunch of rules about that in the Old and the New Testament. That was okay. And then God nominated his son for a human blood sacrifice. And then you didn't do anything to deserve this, but you were redeemed automatically by that blood sacrifice that you don't even know about. So whatever you did wrong, slate's been wiped clean. You still got to play ball if you want to get salvation. But you've been redeemed. And, uh, and then uh, we wear a talisman of God's Son being crucified and suffering and bleeding. And that's what we meditate on. We think about that a lot. We put that on all of our buildings. And so we are a... Oh, and you know, there's, you know, our main sacrament is we eat the body of the person who was crucified. So you eat a little wafer, and that's his body, and then you drink some grape juice, and that becomes his blood, and that's how we remember this blood human sacrifice, is we ritually eat the carcass of the person who died, remember his death, which paid our debt, even though we didn't do anything to deserve it. And that's our tradition. That's the core of our tradition. That's exotic. That's unusual. And I don't think this way because I was born, I, I was raised Orthodox Christian. I grew up with Christianity. It's just, I can hate as much as I want to because it's my tribe. I'm a loyal opposition. I put in my 15 years or whatever it was. I got christened. I got baptized. The whole nine, kit and caboodle. I also studied Christianity for years in a seminary. And so I'm allowed to say whatever I want because it's my people. <laughs> but even though it's my tradition, I can tell you, if I'm able to do the thought experiment and separate myself, it sounds really wild. And if you talk to Indian people from India who weren't raised, or if you talk to Jewish people, who weren't raised with Christianity. The Jewish culture also is not quite as monolithic, but they do an amazing job of preserving their heritage by teaching the Hebrew language to their children. And it's, a, it's, it's amazing to me how the Jewish population of the U.S. manages to avoid knowing anything about Christianity. I got so many Jewish friends, and none of them know anything about Christianity before they talk to me. Like, I don't know, I go, we, we, we celebrate, you know, <laughs> we celebrate different holidays, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur. <laughs> you follow? And, but, so it's amazing how you can even be born in the U.S. and not know this stuff. But if you were to look at Christianity's teachings, and you had no early marinating in the tradition, where it was given to you before you could even really think. And you learned it culturally from your parents as a... almost like, almost like a way of looking at the world. It becomes your operating system as opposed to an optional app that you can either download or not. If you just look at it objectively, it is wild. I'm not saying it's not true. I'm not saying it's not true. But it's exotic. As exact as they come. Cannibal, death cult, ritual cannibalism on the daily, built on the platform of slavery and blood sacrifice. It's, it's more Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom than Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. If you know that referent, if you're old enough to know that referent. Um, 
And I'm not saying that Hinduism doesn't have its wild stuff, but the exotic thing we're going to go over now, and it's exotic because it's philosophically unusual unless you're raised in this tradition, but although it might be foreign, I think it's really straightforward and plain and makes a lot of sense. How much sense? I think it makes sense just like the things I mentioned at the beginning of class. Any tradition has to have a theophany because if they don't have a theophany, they have no way to legitimate their own tradition. And therefore you will find at the core of every tradition some kind of revelation. The same way that makes sense logically. And it's impossible to even think about a tradition that doesn't acknowledge that. Similarly, what we're about to study right now, although unusual and perhaps outside of your normal frame of reference, it's just as common sense and logical and obvious. So here we go. Right after the Theophany, and one Western scholar who translated the Gita from Sanskrit into English, he opined, he said, it's the biggest letdown moment in the entire history of world literature because there is this incredible, epic, mythic theophany where a guy, I mean, it, it's so powerful that Oppenheimer, the father of the hydrogen bomb, quoted the verse from the Gita in the 11th chapter when the first nuclear bomb went off. Kalo asmi lokakshai krit pravritam, time I am the great destroyer of everything. This is also a very exotic concept, but God is death. Normally we like to think of God, I mean, I don't think many people actually think about God too much in terms of actually having concrete thoughts. But a lot of times you think of God as a father figure, more exotic, you might think of God as a mother figure. Um, a lot of times we associate God with good things that happen in our life. But bad things are just as standard as good things. And so a real full tradition would be able to link everything that happens to divinity, not just the good stuff. Otherwise, you get left with a bunch of things that don't fit into the equation, and then you need a devil to account for all the bad stuff. And that creates a radical dualism, which, of course, runs counter to the very idea of theism, that there's one ring to rule them all, and you end up with this irreducible dualism where evil is as fundamental and powerful as good and you almost end up with two deities a god and a devil if you don't want to have to go down that road of dualism you have to find a way to reconcile the quote unquote evil that exists in the world the suffering that exists in the world and find value in it and in fact that's just what's happening when Krishna says I am death I am time I am entropy Time as the degrader of all things, as the reducer of all things, as the um, destroyer. Loka Kshayakrit, the great destroyer. Kshay means to destroy. Loka Kshay, the destroyer of the world. Krit, the one who makes the destruction of the world. And so, what destroys the world? Time. Time is entropy. It is how things move from a more organized to a more chaotic state. It's how they disintegrate over time. Everything, even plastic disintegrates. It might take 15,000 years to disintegrate, but it disintegrates nonetheless. Um, nevertheless. So, right after that occurred, the author said it was the greatest letdown in all of world literature because where do you go from God appearing and dropping truth bombs like time I am, destroy the world, things that are so good they get quoted by Oppenheimer. And that's the 12th chapter. This is the next verse after that theophany finishes. Uh, in contrast to this foolish American exegete who didn't understand the first thing about the Gita, 
when I read the 12th chapter, I think, wow, what a brilliant follow-up. Couldn't be any more tight. And so Arjun asks a question. Um, and the Gita has a different model. Rather than following this, you know, God laying out dictums like a, like a Ten Commandment type situation or the 613 mitzvahs of Deuteronomy um, and Leviticus, what you, what you get is you get the uh, uh, um, you get a series of questions and answers. And so you get a logical coherent theology. Um, and so just this whole idea of faith and reason. Reason and belief. Faith versus logic. Over here you got logic and reason. Over here you have faith and belief. That artificial dichotomization doesn't exist in the Gita. Faith is reasonable, logical, natural. It's demonstrable, it's repeatable. It makes perfect sense. Of course, the Greeks had the same idea, which is why the word logos and theos get used together. Actually, it's there in the Bible. In the beginning was logos, and logos was theos. In the beginning was logic, and logic was God. There was this idea that when you look around the world and you see everything follows fundamental forces, everything is, uh, 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 follows a system, and you can look at the uh, for fundamental forces of physics either on a classical or a quantum level, and you can see that they are repeatable, and they are normative, and they govern society, well, the creator of those things would also tend to be reasonable and logical. And therefore, by looking at the world, you understand something about the nature of the Creator. And that's why when you found logic or reason, for most traditional philosophers, you were getting closer to divinity, not further away from divinity. And so that lack of an artificial dichotomy between faith and reason is found in the Gita. And you find those two things are married together. So Arjun asks a question, and it's a brilliant question, and it's an unusual question. He asks, Tesham ke yoga vittamaha. Who is the greatest knower of yoga? Bhaktastvam satata yuktaye, those who are always yoked to you and who are your devotees, paryupasate, and worship you with devotion, or ye chapi aksharam avyaktam. Or paryupasate, those who worship you as avyakta, unmanifested, akshara, undecaying, anirdesha, indefinable, sarvatragam, pervading everything, achintyam, unthinkable. Who's a better devotee? Who's yoga vit tama? Yoga means yoga. Um, in this case, it would mean truth. I think it would probably be the best translation of yoga in this particular context. Uh, existential, fundamental truth, ontological truth, to, to use it, uh, the proper terminology. Who would be the greatest knower of ontological truth? If that's not redundant. Um, yoga vit dhamma. Dhamma means greatest. It's like this, it is a superlative in Sanskrit. So you have good, better, best. Better is the comparative, better than the good. And then best is the superlative, the most good becomes the best. So in Sanskrit, you create that um, uh, linguistic idea by using the suffix tama. And vit means knower. So yoga, vit, tama. The greatest knower of yoga. Vit comes from vid, which is where you get the word Veda from, books of knowledge. Ayurveda, knowledge of life, that's Indian medicine. Um, Veda is also where you get the English word video from. Because through videos you see things and you know them. And so the etymological root of video and idea, the word idea, <laughs> is vid. It's the... It's the verbal root that gave rise to English words such as idea and video. 
So yoga vit tama. Tesham ke yoga vit tama. Who is of them? Who is the great snower of yoga? Now there's two possibilities. So Arjun is asking a very specific question. He's saying amongst these two, who is the greatest knower of yoga? Now you guys got to pay attention. I've been warming you up, but now we're gonna now we're gonna we're gonna start moving. Train's gonna leave the station, guys. So let's let's stay tight now. Here we go. Arjuna lays out two possibilities of who could be the greatest knower of yoga, and he wants to compare and figure out which one of those two is the best. The first category is what would be considered to be a normal devotee in any religion of the world. And so that is someone who worships God as the, I say the ultimate parent, the ultimate friend. You are a person. God's your source. You have some sort of a parental type relationship with God where God's your parent, mother, father. Heaven is a place where God exists and you exist and you have a relationship based on love together. And so there might be some service. Maybe you play a harp or you float around on cherub-like wings, whatever it might be. Um, the Hebrew Torah has a much wilder version of angels. They have four faces, a lion face and a, um, a bear face and an eagle face and one other. And they have four sets of wings. They fly in multiple different directions simultaneously. Kind of like when you see a UFO and it's like, dancing around at the speed of light, kind of like that. You can read about that in the book of Ezekiel if you're interested. But anyway, then you get like these nine levels of angels and cherubs and that whole um, great chain of being and scala naturi and what became Catholicism and how they, the sort of cute little eunuchs that are floating around. Um, it was a much later development, a much more, with a lot more artistic um, license being taken. So, despite the, you know, the kind of weird ideas people have of what heaven's like and if it's like a block party and everybody's young and handsome and who's married to who, um, just the core idea that your individuality is concrete. Let me say that again. The core idea that your individuality is concrete. Which means that when you achieve perfection, you are still you. You might not be your body, but you're still you. In the sense that your individuality is real. It is fundamental. It's eternal. You gotta work a little harder, guys. Just a little bit harder. Stand up. That's the gig. Stand up, hold your baby. Let's see how it works. No, don't leave. Ah, that's not on the menu. Just stand back there, hold your baby. There you go. That's it. You're good. And you guys can trade off. If mom's arms get tired, you can co-parent, dad. Don't, don't mess with her now. Just you can co-parent after a few minutes if mom's arms get tired. And if, I, if this fails and it doesn't work and she's just too big and, and wily, then so be it. Let her walk around and we'll figure it out. Thank you. I'm sorry. You guys drove all the way down here. I last as long as I could. If we're light, I can, I can walk and chew gum. We start doing philosophy. It gets a little harder for me to... It just gets a little more ping-pongy in my head. Um, even my own kids. I have six kids. I've been living with ear-damaging racket. for the last 20 years. And sometimes I just feel disturbed and I can't focus on what I'm doing. I'll realize, oh, one of my kids is screaming bloody murder in the vicinity. I've been shutting it out from my conscious thoughts, but it's nonetheless nerve-wracking and I can't figure out why I'm having an adrenaline dump for no reason while trying to read something. And oh, it's because somebody's screaming. 
Um, so, the core idea that your individuality is concrete, that you are a person forever, that when you achieve perfection, you don't disintegrate your individuality, you will be an individual forever. Maybe not this body, maybe an eternal dot of light, whatever it is, but your individual concrete existence as a spark of that fire that lasts forever. And that creates possibilities. Namely, that God's also a concrete individual and that you can have a relationship based on love. Without a concrete individual, love disappears. Love requires two. Amazingly, love is a unifying force that makes two into one. You are united in love. But if you get rid of the substrate of duality, love also disappears. If you get rid of the mother and the child as two distinct realities, and you collapse them back into one, like in a pre-pregnant state, then the love between the mother and the child is lost forever. Do you guys follow that? Love binds and unites and makes one, but it ever depends on things being different and distinct in order for it to work its magic. And if you don't believe in individuality forever, you also don't believe in love forever. You don't believe in compassion forever. You don't believe in empathy forever. And all these fine, wonderful qualities, they also have to die an ignoble death as you reduce the world to being homogenized. And one, you know, cosmic goo. So, the first version that Arjuna argues for, he argues for um, who's the better knower of yoga, who knows truth more? The person who worships you as a person, as the supreme creator. Of course, how could we be individuals and have been created in the first place if our creator didn't possess individuality? Where did individuality come from? If everything's ultimately one, why did it ever become two? If you say it's not two, it's just an illusion, then where did the illusion of two come from? Because the illusion of two is still a second reality. The very, the very existence of variety in this world, which is the spice of life, the very existence of love, necessarily indicates that the absolute that gave rise to this world must be individual. Otherwise, where did all the variety of individuality come from? And if you say it's just an illusion, the illusion is itself a variety, an individual reality that's distinct from the other possibility, which is pure homogenization, and therefore you still end up with two, the illusion and the oneness. But how did the illusion come out of the oneness? Oh, the one wanted to enjoy. Okay, that means the one's a person, because it wanted something. It needed something. It thought something. Thoughts don't float around in space. Thoughts attend to an individual who has a thought. Thoughts are possessions. They're not the genesis. An eternal thought is still dependent ontologically on an eternal mind for its existence. You guys following this? So, the first thing that Arjuna says is, who's the greater knower of truth? The one who sees God as a person? Or the one who is into avyakta, achintya, akshara, anirdesha, sarvatragam? The one who's into thinking about God as being achintya, unthinkable. Avyakta, unmanifested. Anirdesha, indescribable. Akshara, indefatigable. Akshaya, inexhaustible. Ananta, without limits. These are all called via negativa terms because they define something not by saying what it is, but by saying what it's not. You do the same thing in Sanskrit you do with English. If you want to say the person who's not a theist, you say atheist, and the A in front of the word, it's modifying, oftentimes indicates the opposite. Sanskrit's the exact same way. Anta means end, ananta means without end. Kshara means decaying, akshara means without decay. 
Chintya means thinking. Achintya, unthinkable. Vyakta, manifested. Avyakta, am unmanifested. So Arjuna invokes negative language. The first instance of using negative language to describe the Absolute is the Upanishads of ancient India. The current term for describing negative philosophy when you describe God via negativa by way of negation, in Sanskrit it's called neti neti, not this, not this. In English it's called apophatic theology. Cataphatic theology is the first. God exists would be a cataphatic theological statement. God exists. An apophatic statement would be God does not exist. Now that's not an atheistic statement. It could be. But an apophatic theologian could say God does not exist because if you think God exists, you'll think God exists like you exist. As a six foot seven Brazilian you know, basketball playing God among men. And so you'll start to um, anthropomorphically extrapolate from your own experience and you'll start to fetter and corrupt God by comparing him to yourself. And so to get away from that, you don't say what God is, you say what God is not. This is so standard nowadays in philosophy and theology that Thomas Aquinas is famous for saying, you cannot say what God is, you can only say what God is not. Thomas Aquinas is the import, most important figure in Catholicism, arguably in Christianity, in the last thousand years. You cannot say what God is, you can only say what God is not. Thousands of years before Aquinas made that statement, thousands of years before the idea of apathetic theology even took hold in the West, Sanskrit literatures were playing this game. And so, you can go even further. Another apophatic statement would be saying, God does not not exist. God does not exist the way, because, see, things can exist or not exist. Like, that's Tadeo. I'm sorry, that's Gorkaley. He got initiated last week. After, what, 15 years? Yep. Finally got ordained in our tradition. Couldn't be prouder. I almost gave him a round of applause. <laughs> um, so now I've got I to unlearn his name. <laughs> Spent decades calling him something. I've got to switch it all up. Um, and so, Gore Cayley, um <laughs> Your groom has a sense of humor. Have you thought about this? Yes. Because <laughs> Gore means golden, but you're more chocolatey than golden. So he could have called you Sham Kaylee. Which is a pass on to Krishna. Krishna's Sham, he's dark. But Gore is golden. So I think he had a little bit of fun fun. Like if you call a big guy tiny. <laughs> and you became Rasa Kaylee, right? He could have also called you Gore Kaylee, because you're more like you're more light and fair skinned than he is. He could have gone Gore and Sham anyway. He could have I think he has a sense of humor. I think he has a sense of humor. Um, and I don't imagine that was lost on him. I think he probably thought of that. And he wanted to switch it up and not play into anything that had to do with your material personality and give you a pure spiritual name that was totally distinct from your material reality. And that your guru's black makes it like all the more cool that he thought to do that, you know? Um, okay, so... Um, Gore Cayley exists, but theoretically we could say Gore Cayley could not exist. This gentleman here. He exists, but he exists, but he could just as easily have not existed. His mother, who may be here, is your mom here? No. His mom, who comes quite a bit to the temple, she could have chosen not to have a child, and then maybe you wouldn't exist. And so a lot of times when you talk about things existing in this world, you mean they're existing, but they're existing in a derivative, contingent sense where they don't have to exist. They're not necessary realities. They're contingent realities. And so, you say God does not exist. I'm saying God is essential. He's not temporary. He's necessary. He's not contingent. He's the parent. He's not derivative. And therefore, I can say to you, God does not exist. 
then I got to take it a step further because now I can think, well, you don't, don't exist. Then it, you might just mean he doesn't exist. Like he actually doesn't. No, no, he does not not exist. And now I'm doubling up. And I'm trying to break you free from thinking about God using any of the ideas you have about yourself in this world. And I'm trying to be very careful and think about things in purely spiritual terms, which means I'm just going to say what it's not so that you don't end up saddling divinity with your own mundane conceptions. Do you follow this? It's a way to proceed very carefully so you don't make mistakes and start thinking God is Californian or white or male or young or old. Or active or passive. If God's always if God's ever passive. Passivity gives rise to relativity. Relativity gives rise to empathy. Empathy gives rise to compassion. Compassion is love manifested towards someone less fortunate than you. And of course, that would be the entire creation compared to divinity. And so, a non-passive deity, a non-relative deity, an absolute non-relative active, non-passive deity would be incapable of empathy and therefore love. There are good ways. And so to try to avoid this, there's a law of propositional logic. You are what you are. You're not this opposite in the same way at the same time. It's one of the three primary laws of propositional logic. It's how we make logical statements, how we think. A thing is itself. That's a law of identity. And it's not its opposite in the same way at the same time. If you're fully inside at this moment, then you're not fully outside at this exact same moment, in the same way. If you're fully present at this moment, you're not fully absent at this moment. We are subject to those, to those laws. But an infinite being would be capable of being fully present and also fully absent. Fully here and fully there. The very nature of omnipotence is it begins to stretch the limits of propositional logic and what's possible because you have an unlimited being. Therefore, God could be everywhere and nowhere in your heart and beyond this world. All powerful and all sweet, all just and all grace at the same time. That's a reasonable thing for an omnipotent being. To try to force yourself to think more creatively and less anthropomorphically, just based on extrapolating from your own existence. Apophatic theology is used all over the world and has incredible value. In fact, we find the Vedas are the first instance of it, and they rejoice in speaking about Brahman, or spirit, as tat, as that. Tat Brahma, nishkalam anantam. Tat Brahma, nishkalam What is a tat brahma nishkalam? Anantam asheshabhutam. That brahman is nishkala, undivided. No kalas, no parts. It's undivided. And it's anantam, again, limitless. And it's asheshabhutam. It's... Um, there's no limit to its existence. It's limitless. No, it's never ending and limitless. You have to give a little different meaning to Ananta. It has no end and it also uh, expands without limit. These are very common statements in the Upanishadic literature. It refers to Brahman as a that. In fact, Arjuna himself asks, Kim Tut Brahma, what is that Brahman in the Gita? And Krishna answers, uh, Aksharam Brahma Paramam. The Supreme Brahman is that which is undecaying. It's the undecaying reality. This type of language is all over the Gita, it's all over the Vedic literatures. It's apophatic language, negative language, language which tries to just say what God is not and never say what God is. And Arjuna wants to know is that the best tradition? Is that the best knower of yoga? The person who does that. And Krishna answers definitively. Next verse. 
Krishna says, Maya Vesha Mano Ye Mam in the Yukta Upasri Shadhaya Parai Upetas Te Me Yukta Tamamataha. I consider those people who worship me as the Supreme Being to be the greatest knowers of yoga. And he goes on to say those people who worship God as merely indefinite, as merely indescribable, as merely impersonal, those people just end up inviting trouble for themselves. He relegates it to a lower position, an intermediate position, that ultimately has to result in a love for a supreme being. So this question Arjuna asks, what is the nature of divinity? Is divinity ultimately personal or impersonal? And who's, who knows the truth the best? The one who worships God as a person or the one who worships God as just an indefinite thing? And Krishna responds back and says the one who worships him as a person is better. This is the biggest question in the world of religion. Once you decide that divinity exists, the next question is, what's the nature of that divinity? And the, the first question that you should ask yourself is, is that, how should I think about that divinity? Is God my friend? If he's your friend, he's a person. Is God your parent? If he's your parent, he's a person. Is she your parent? If she's your parent, she's a person. Does God care about you? Does the universe care about you? If it does, it's a person, because only people are capable of caring. I'm not saying a human. I'm not saying a human in a body of flesh and blood is going to decay. I'm saying the fundamental individuality and conscious individuality that, that makes up a person. An individual unit of consciousness capable of thought and love and feeling for another individual unit of consciousness. If God doesn't possess that level of individuality, then God doesn't care about you. If you say the universe is trying to help me, you're just saying God's a person, but you're too cowardly to admit it. You're using euphemistic language to avoid thinking it through. This question that's asked by Arjuna still does not exist in Western theology and philosophy. Let me say that again. This question that's asked by Arjuna thousands of years ago still does not exist in Western philosophy. There is no language for designating the impersonal divinity from the personal divinity in English. We coin the terms personal and impersonal. Those terms are not used by theologians. Srila Prabhupada, our exegete, our founder, he coined those terms when he came to the West because he found that there were no equivalents for the Sanskrit Vaishnava and Shaiva, Dvaita and Advaita. Terms which are standard and have been for thousands of years. A whole language has been developed to have robust conversations about the nature of divinity, whether it's personal or impersonal. There are thousands of years of statements in this regard that can be studied. There's an entire lexicon, an entire vocabulary dedicated to just finally articulating this point. We don't even have the two terms in the West. Monism doesn't, doesn't work because you could be a monist and be an, you could be an atheist. You could be a physical monist who believes all there is is matter. Monotheist and monist don't do it at all. There is no language. When we want to talk about these things, I have to spend paragraphs and pages talking about it because there's no language for it. There's a language apophatic and cataphatic for the way you describe divinity, but not for the way you think about divinity. Not for your conception of what the ultimate truth is. So somehow, on just immediately following his vision of Krishna, which was a complete vision where he saw Krishna in all things at once and also individual so that you could love. He saw both. And so then he asked, which one of these is the chicken and which one's the egg? Which one came from which? Which one is more original? What's the highest conception of divinity?
That's the most important question you can ask once you believe in a higher truth, once you believe in a higher power, is what's the nature of that higher power? The question itself is glorious. And the first thing to answer is, is the higher power an individual, therefore capable of a relationship, therefore capable of love, thought, feeling, compassion, grace? Or is it merely a force like the law of karma, devoid of thought and feeling and robotic? And if both are the reality, which is what Arjuna experienced, then which one is the highest conception? If both, which one's derivative and which one's primary? Anyway, there's a lot more we could talk about with this. But what I want to do for just a couple of minutes is point out that then, when you decide that God is a person, that God's capable of love, then you start to think about, well, what's that relationship like? And although you might not want to fetter God by comparing divinity to anything within your experience, you kind of got no choice because what do you have to, to use to think about the world except for your own experience? There's no way to avoid it. We can be careful, but we still ultimately have to springboard off of our own experience to make sense out of anything. That's why if you've had a terrible relationship with your parents and you think about guys being a parental figure, it can sometimes be disturbing. you got no choice but to base things on your own prior experience. So once you accept that the divinity ultimately is a person, because you're a person, where'd you come from? Because being a person is better than not being a person. Because love exists and only a person is capable of love. Once you start to do all this math, then you start to think about, well, what kind of person is God? And our general boilerplate relationship with divinity is we think about God as being our parent. Why? Because you think about God when you want something. Think about it. You're going through a hard time in life. You can't navigate it. Maybe you have to biopsy some tissue. Think you might have the big C. Need open heart surgery. You're getting old. Need a hip replacement. Lost your job. Things are scary. They're dangerous. You're not sure what's going to happen. And so then you pray. You pray to God like a super powerful parental figure up in the sky who can stack the deck in your favor. Sometimes you do a little something. I was, just, I, just, I was at the temple doing worship earlier this week and somebody brought a small bag of pennies. Like, you know, like 30 pennies or something like that. Maybe 50 or whatever. And so you know, they didn't even bother putting the pennies in the hundi. They just left the bag of pennies on top of the donation box. So I had to take all... I think I probably got more credit for that donation than they did. But... And I mean, don't get me wrong. It's cool. If that's all you've got is pennies, you're good. If you have more than pennies and all you offer Christian is pennies, then he'll just offer you pennies in return. And whatever you want on your, for your return on your investment, expect to get a reward. <laughs> expecting to get a similar reward. Um, I don't know why I got into the pennies thing. I was headed... To, oh! Yeah, you know, you... He, throw a little donation in the donation box. You want that job, make maybe a quarter million dollars a year? I'll give 20 bucks, and here you go. Or I'll give like 40 cents, here you go. Hope I get that job. <laughs> it's some, it's God's somewhere in our minds between like a super powerful parental figure who controls all reality and a waiter at a cafe <laughs> that we're trying to get to give us better service. We kind of right in the middle there. We give them the equivalent of what we would give a waiter that we're trying to grease their palm and get a little favorable service. But then we expect them to be the master of all reality and stack the deck in our favor through the most difficult times in our life. That's a parental relationship. Most of us think of God as a parent when we are in need. Better, you think of God as a child. Krishna worship, our tradition, our conception of divinity. We worship God as a child. We think God as a person. But we, we think this whole parent thing has been overdone. 
And Krishna says in the Gita, Pitaham Asya Jagat, I'm the father of the universe. Mata, I'm the mother of the universe. So it's not that these ideas aren't there. Krishna invokes all sorts of parental imagery. He says, Mama Yoni Mahat Brahma, the great Brahman is my womb. Tasmin, garba, gar, gar, garbam dadam yaham. Into that womb I place the seed. So he claims that creation of the universe is a sexual act where it's both his womb as well as he is the uh, seed giver. And so this, this, this type of language is used by Krishna, claiming both the masculine and the feminine, which is unusual in spirituality for God to claim both a masculine and feminine relationship to the devotee. But Krishna does that in the Gita in multiple places. The mother and the father. And you see that also. You see feminine moieties, feminine halves of the divinity always. It's a Sita Ram, Lakshmi Narayan, Radha Krishna. And so that's one of the very cool, very egalitarian features of Hinduism. It's been around for thousands of years. Um, but another even more subversive one is that instead of worshiping God as a parent, which is generally attached to asking for something, even if you're grateful. If I'm grateful to my parent, why am I grateful? Because you did things for me when I was a child, and now I'm all grown up and I can give something back. It's still linked to you did something for me, so I'm going to do something for you. Krishna worship, in our iconography and the way we do it, and now we worship God as black. The word Krishna literally means black. So we worship a black deity. Feminine and child. It subverts almost all of the standard ways in which people think about divinity. And we worship God as a child because instead of asking for things, we want to just give. And when you have a child, you don't ask for things, you just give. You just do for your child without asking for anything in return. And so we model our worship after that. So, we just got one minute left, but I wanted to make the point that the first thing, the most important thing, is to decide, after deciding that divinity exists, is what's the nature of that divinity. And although there's incredible value in thinking of God indefinitely, so that you won't imagine God to just be like you, there's also severe limitations if that's all you can do. There's great value in our individuality. There's great value in our personhood. There's great value in our capacity for love and thought and feeling. And deep theology means you get rid of thinking of God as a white male landholder. You get rid of thinking about God in really limiting terms that are sectarian and tribal. But you don't throw out the baby with the bathwater. And you still preserve core ideas like individuality and the capacity for love and compassion. And you find just that debate happening in the Gita. Right on the tail end of the epic theophany. As Arjuna is trying to figure out, now that I've experienced something spiritual, now that I believe in something spiritual, what's the nature? How should I relate to God? How should I think about God? And Krishna answers unequivocally. And this question is so high and so important and so, like, foundational. And somehow there is no language in English for this debate. We have to coin our own terms when we want to talk about this stuff. It's totally standard in the Vedic tradition. And you find in the Vedic tradition, in the Gita, that Krishna is described impersonally. He is described in very generic, via negativa language, and also described in via positiva language. So you get the best, best of both worlds. And once you accept that God is a person, then the next natural question becomes, what is the nature of that deity? And usually we think of God as being a parent a father or a mother figure, depending on whether you're needing protecting or nurturing. 
But there's other possibilities. One of which is you can think of God as a child, just receiving love. And although you find things like the baby Jesus movement, that like weird baby Jesus movement of the, of the deep south, there's no theology attached to it. There's just the icons. There's just the baby Jesus picture. But there's no actual theological import attached to it. But when we worship Christians as a child, we really just stop thinking about asking for anything and start thinking about what we can do. Instead of throwing 20 or 20 pennies or whatever, treating God like a waiter and a parent at the same time. Kind of how we treat our own parents, right? Mm -hmm. Expecting stuff from them, giving very little return oftentimes. Or even being a good child. And I've grown up now and you did for me, I'm going to do for you. We just want to get rid of all of that. And so we think of God as a child. Ourselves as the parents. And that's Krishna worship in a nutshell. And so these ideas, Father's Day and the ultimate father and the ultimate mother and how to think about divinity and how you think about divinity, although we might be raised with a particular worldview, the cannibalistic death cult I mentioned in the beginning <laughs> with the blood sacrifices and the slavery back, uh, uh, backdrop, or we might be raised with this paternalistic relationship with divinity where we sort of simultaneously condescend and supplicate to divinity and ask for stuff. Although those things might be normal and it's how we were raised, it doesn't mean they're logical or reasonable or the only possibility. Although in yoga you might think, yeah, the less you think about God as being a person, the better. The universe sent this to me. No, it's just the universe. It's not a person. It's just the universe. Yeah, universe is capable of thought and feeling and helping you out and doing things for you an omnipotent, omnibenevolent, omniscient universe that knows your thoughts and what you need and helps you out, a rose by any other name still smells just as sweet. And so there's other possibilities, and we should try to expand our horizons, and I want to take some of the unusual, subversive ideas and anachronistic and non-standard ideas and show how they are contending with big questions, reasonable questions, important questions, and offering powerful answers. Okay, that's it. Let's do a little cure time. Thank you so much.